Welcome back to my review now here of the Samsung Galaxy Tab S8 Ultra. I've used it now a week. This mammoth tablet, 14.6 inches, is absolutely fantastic. 5.5 millimeters thin. It weighs just over 760 grams. And I did find in my first impressions that, well, it's, you know, as you'd expect, very big for your standard kind of tablet use. You really want to have it in the keyboard stand or in a stand like I have now. So has my first impressions changed? This video will also follow up on things that were missing in my first impressions. I'll focus on the performance, take a look and analyze what kind of frame rates we get, the refresh rate, battery life and charge time, and pretty much all you need to know really about this particular mammoth tablet here from Samsung. I wanted to look here at this UI performance. So one UI now a week later has just been fantastic for me. Performance is really good. Everything is fast, so the gestures are working good there. Swapping over between various different applications, it's all really nice and smooth and quick, and I don't really see too much noticeable lag, but I do sometimes see a little bit of a frame dip, okay? Here and there. So what I'm showing right now is this, was 120's not actually our FPS counter, that is the refresh rate. So what I wanted to do here is just take a little look at the performance, what kind of frame rate is it delivering? So under the developer settings, if you go into developer options, you can enable this, which is called GPU Watch. Now I've got it on, turned it on now, the widget, and you'll see right here, the average frames per second, 121. So that's good, but you will see here when sometimes you trigger things like the gestures and you're scrolling and moving about, see how it dipped down to 84 to 60 to 30. So that's just the way the UI is, but you don't really see these dips unless you're someone that plays um, high FPS games, like you're used to your 144 hertz monitor, gaming at 144 hertz. You'll probably pick up on that, okay? But the average Joe won't. You won't be able to see like the noticeable lag or anything like that. Often when bringing up just all of the apps there in the app drawer, can sometimes trigger a little bit of a frame dip, but it's pretty solid. This performance is good. And I just go back to some other apps here. So some of them will be rendered at 60. And here it's only pumping out four frames per second, as you can see. So this is saving a bit of battery life. So that's good really, because why do we need this to be pumped out at 120 frames per second? We don't. You see that when we start to move though, that frame rate then picks up to 120 or well over at least 90 most of the time. And that is smooth, okay? I'm not really seeing any lag. It's very, very smooth performance here in Netflix. And it's gonna be like this in a lot of content that when it's static now, it won't take too long. That frame rate should actually drop down again, but it's keeping at 117 there, which is good. And that'll be throughout the UI. You're gonna see this in Chrome. Uh, other areas you can see right now that that's only four frames per second. That doesn't need to pump out much. And why is that? It's because this page hasn't loaded. Okay, there we go. But once you start to scroll, same thing, okay? So while it's not an adaptive refresh rate, it is adaptive rendering, you could say, okay? Which is a good thing. That's gonna save on our battery life. On the subject of battery life, what am I able to get? So screen on time, seven hours and 48 minutes. This was at 120 hertz. So if you run it at 60, you will get, I would say, about 10 hours of screen on time. Now you can see my use here that I was doing a little bit of, well, emulation there, PlayStation 2, a lot of Netflix, okay, watching some episodes mostly um, at night there, and this is why there was a few pauses during the day, that's night time. So standby battery drain was very good. It only dropped a couple of percent, uh, a lot better than what I've seen on previous One UI ROMs, but that's been One UI 2 and 3. And on Android 12, it seems to be reasonably good here, okay? A little bit of gaming, as you can see, and in Tutu Benchmark. Now, did I run it for two hours and 36 minutes? I didn't, but I had it in the background because it was measuring the charging times. That's what I'll get onto. So realistically, I do believe my brightness was set to uh, approximately 200 nits, okay, which is reasonable for indoors. I believe that most people should be able to get between seven and nine hours, uh, maybe even less. Of course, if you game, you're really only looking at about four hours, really, or, or less than that, actually, about three and a half. Charge time. So here we go. Now, this is not the official charger because I didn't get one in the box and I'm not going to buy one. So I used my 45 watt power delivery charger. No, in fact, it's 65 watts. And it took only 100 minutes to go from 9% to 
to 100%, which is very good. It's almost an 11,000 milliamp hour battery. So I don't think that's too bad, especially for Samsung that is, that the previous models did not charge very fast. Performance, so I just wanted to show this very quickly, okay, I won't drag this out, that it could perform better here. Samsung have basically underclocked this. They've not let it reach its full potential here, the Snapdragon 8 Gen 1. And I do know this because I'm testing phones that can reach a million points and over or slightly under with Antutu. If you like your Antutu scores, you can see here at least that it could do better. It could definitely do a lot better, but Samsung decided to throttle it or power limit it. The internal storage, UFS 3.1, very, very quick here. Uh, those sequential reads and writes are excellent. And the random reads and writes, which are the important ones, they are looking very good there. Not a problem with that. So I've already covered all this in my other video, but I just wanted to touch base that the performance out of it is super quick, very fast. One of the fastest Android tablets, if not the fastest. I have our FPS counter and resource monitor right there with the GPU and the CPU. We can see what kind of load it's under. And let's have a look now at a very demanding game, Genshin Impact. I won't bother about PUBG because that's not actually that demanding, but this title certainly is. Oh, my widget's floating around all over the place here. Now you can see this is where the refresh rate's no longer 120. It's gone now to 60 hertz, which makes sense because this game doesn't run at 120 hertz. It's 60 max. So we're looking around 45 down to even 32 frames per second here. Now, it's not because, I want to stress this, not because it's face down on the table. The only reason I'm playing it face down on the table, so I'm holding it like this, there's going to be my lights and reflections all over the place. That's why I'm not doing it. And if I was to play like that, the result will be exactly the same. I've already tested this in a previous video. So why is the performance here not performing as it could. I've got a phone at the moment that I'm reviewing that has the Snapdragon 8 Gen 1. It runs a solid 60 frames per second, even after one hour, even in the demanding areas, even with boss battles, everything. It's a super solid frame rate and performance, whereas what Samsung has decided to do, wow, down to 29 frames per second on the top settings here. What Samsung decided to do is play it safe, all right? They don't want it to get too hot and when you look now with the thermal imaging camera uh, this is actually after gaming for one hour get up gets up to about 36 37 degrees celsius on the back so definitely samsung's playing it safe they could push this chip so much harder but they just chose not to they want it to be cool they don't want issues they don't want to damage the batteries they've got their reasons behind it but i hope with the firmware update they improve the gaming performance Quick look at YouTube. So once the quality picks up here of my internet connection or the buffer health, should I say, it will run it at 1080p, but that's all it seems to be for me. I don't know if it'll switch over to 1440, but it won't do 4K. That was a common question. YouTube playback, I've not seen any issues with it. It looks great on such a massive screen, just viewing one of my own videos here. So I don't get slammed by copyright from anyone else. Okay, that's the only reason I'm doing that. Not to blow my own trumpet here or anything. Getting out of that, it's still very good, and the scrolling performance, uh, great, okay, no issues. But what I wanted to test now is those four AKG tuned speakers. They are excellent, very loud, but not only that, they're rich, and I'll give you a sample at 100% volume now. So those are some impressive speakers. They're very loud. Now, are they better than the iPad Pro 12.9? I don't have it on hand anymore. I sold mine, but I do believe they are. I think they are better. These are probably the best uh, tablet speakers. They've done an excellent job with them and the bass you get out of them, but they don't distort either. I don't see anyone complaining about these speakers. No one's going to go and say, oh, they sound terrible because they don't. They're fantastic. And our web camera, so this is one area that the Tab S8 Ultra certainly excels. I think it has the best webcams, hands down, that I have seen in a tablet. So two 2 megapixel cameras. This is the main one. We don't have any electronic image stabilization, so you can see it shakes around a little bit. But this is not going to be an issue because you'll probably be using this in the keyboard dock or in a stand, so you wouldn't really be holding it. So if I tap now, I can ultra wide. And you can see you can do this on the fly without actually breaking the video. So this quality, I think, is going to be excellent for Zoom calls, WhatsApp, Skype, things like that. 
So if I swap over back again to the main camera, you see that one's slightly better quality. What I really like about this as well is listen to the quality of these microphones. You can probably hear that rooster in the background crowing. Really, really good quality here. And I think this is definitely the best video quality you get out of front-facing cameras on a tablet. Just like the front cameras, you can shoot 4K video with the rear camera. It's 13 megapixels. We've got that ultra-wide too that you can swap over to, but not as you're recording because it only supports 1080p. But the main camera here, 13 megapixels with electronic image stabilization. The quality is reasonably good for a tablet but not quite as good and as sharp and as detailed as those front-facing cameras. Now photo samples, just a few snaps here, you can see that it does take a reasonably good photo, the Tab S8 Ultra. Now our screen, this is what it's all about, 14.6 inches, absolutely huge. So we'll just go into it a little bit here and my thoughts on the screen. Now a lot of people got a bit triggered when I mentioned it doesn't have DC dimming, and for me that was not an issue, but it would be really nice to have. Why is it nice to have? Well, it's a form of controlling the brightness and it should stop any flicker, but it doesn't. It's got pulse width modulation. If you're very sensitive to pulse width modulation flicker on AMOLED screens, then at lower brightness levels, you could possibly see it. Now I've done my best here to make the screen look and represent exactly what it's like, but you see this bit of effect going on, that's to do with the glass, okay, it should actually look a little bit better, but there's no banding now showing it all in my video here, touch response, great, 120 hertz, it's a fantastic screen, now the PPI, when I mentioned in the first impressions video that it's not as sharp as the Tab S7 Plus screen, that again seemed to have triggered a few Samsung fans, it's just a fact, okay, because the pixel density on this model isn't as dense, they're not as densely packed the pixels as that other Tab S7 Plus, but it makes sense because it's a smaller tablet, this is larger. By no means is the screen blurry, it was just a straight out comment to say it doesn't look as sharp as the Tab S7 Plus when you look at it closely, but normal viewing distances, fantastic screen, gestures work great, touch input, very good, it reacts instantly really no one is going to be complaining about this screen because it is a grade, one of the best tablet screens out there. Very quickly, our S Pen. So this for a lot of people is the key reason to get it, of course, because you've got a huge amount of screen real estate here to use, nice sharp resolution. And this pen has now a 2.8 millisecond latency. Latency there is incredible, very fast. And I, I can't detect or see with my eyes anyway, any delay there, it seems to be uh, very, very quick. As soon as you write there, it is coming out. So solid. And of course, the harder you press, those pressure sensitive levels are then triggered and the darker it was going to be. So for apps that support that, S Pen support nowadays, of course, is very, very good here. So you can enable a lot of apps that only the S Pen is going to work. So you don't have any problems then because it's palm rejection, total palm rejection. And you're able to jot down notes very, very quick. So for handwriting, it's Great, okay. Really good experience here with the S Pen. Now the fingerprint reader has something that I have been uh, complaining about. It's been hit and miss. The weird thing is it's starting to get better and better and better. It was the first day it was terrible. The second day wasn't great. It must have some sort of, my, this is the only thing I can think of, some sort of algorithm that's actually learning here. So watch as I test this out. That's good. I don't know what's going on. It's getting better and better. It's starting to work better. Either that or the moisture levels in my skin for some reason now are working a lot better than what it was in the first few days. But this is strange. It really has improved. What's my final verdict then after a week with this? It is hands down the best Android tablet. It's a fantastic tablet and probably the best tablet at the moment at the time of this video. There are a couple of areas that I hope Samsung can improve upon with firmware updates. First off, my biggest complaint is that fingerprint reader. I've reviewed all of their Galaxy phones and this is something that's reoccurring. And on the initial release, fingerprint readers aren't perfect, okay, aren't great. Remember the S10? I had a lot of problems with my S10. 
it's kind of like that a little bit. So there's definitely they have to improve that. Now there's some absolute hilarious comments on my first video that people said, I was making it look bad, you're supposed to tap and hold, you're tapping too slow, you need to tap faster. If you don't hold for a second or so, it tells you please hold, okay? So it's not me, it's just the way it is. And as I demonstrated in this video, it's still problematic anyway. The other is the performance of the Snapdragon 8 Gen 1. While it is super quick, very fast, fast wireless, we're only reaching about 90% or 85% of the true potential of this chip. How do I know this? Well, I'm reviewing phones that have the Snapdragon 8 Gen 1, and they can get a lot higher points. Uh, I'm talking about a million, over a million points with Antutu, just if you look at that benchmark, okay? And this scores well less. So it's around 15, even over percent that they've throttled it back. They're limiting the power limits, they're lowering the clock speeds, and the thermals on it are fantastic. So I've seen, after gaming for hours on this, or an hour, PUBG, Genshin Impact, it gets warm around where the camera is. They could have done a better job with the thermals, maybe a transfer heat pipe in there, a bit of graphite film or whatever, uh, a few tricks up their sleeve to make it a bit better to push the performance. So I hope a firmware update comes out that they allow it to get a little warmer to the touch. It's normally called the skin sensor, where it's warmer. If they just push that up to, instead of being around 35 degrees to throttle it, set it to 42 or something. We could push it a bit harder there. The screen. It is very, very good, okay? It's bright, it's AMOLED, it's 120 hertz, and I've got zero complaints with it, really. Apart from it doesn't have DC dimming. So for some people, ultra-sensitive to pulse width modulation flicker, with the DC dimming, which is another form of using current, another form of manipulating uh, the brightness control, it reduces that flicker. So it's a shame it's not there. Maybe it could be added with software. I don't know if that's possible. That's just one minor thing, but the brightness is there. The auto um, adaptive brightness is working great too. I don't really have any issues with it. Touch response is great, and then S Pen. So for the artists out there, definitely you want to get it for this, for that uh, S Pen. The other things I can point out, wireless performance, amazing. Speakers, amazing. Uh, it really is quite good. And the build in general, very thin, very fragile. But let's get on to then the use of this. So this is why my first impressions was that it's a, it's a huge tablet, a little bit too big for me personally is what I was getting at. For me, the sweet spot is about 12.4, okay? So the Tab S7 Plus or the S8 Plus for me is a better size, I think, okay? Because I use my tablets, me personally, my own use, everyone's different, of course, as tablets. I like to hold them. And after about 10, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, it's like, ah, it's a bit heavy. I've been watching a lot of Netflix on this, so I end up having to just let it support its own weight and hold it, which is fine, and it's, wow, you know, an amazing screen to be looking at their content. Gaming on it, I would do with a controller, but if you've only got touch controls with a game like Genshin Impact, you're out of luck, and it is a bit uncomfortable with this tablet to then use it a gaming like that. I don't find great. So that's why I said that it's too a bit of a niche product, like artists are just going crazy for this. Stylus, of course, that huge screen you can use, and the latency of the, of the S Pen is absolutely brilliant. So I believe, still, that most people will use this as a laptop. An Android laptop, you'll keep it in the keyboard dock. It comes with the keyboard dock when you pre-order, or at least it does here in Europe, and you'll probably be having it stood up here in a stand, or you'll use the keyboard case stand cover. So it's really not so much a tablet, more a laptop that you can use for short, bursts, short periods as a tablet there. It's a very niche product for me still, I'm going to say that, that nothing's changed. It's a little bit too big as a tablet, to use it as a tablet that is. So thank you so much for watching my follow-up one week review. I may have more videos on this, so do subscribe for those. Probably when my keyboard gets here, I'll go over the experience of using it like a laptop then, focusing a little bit more on the desktop mode and day-to-day -day usage with such a monster of a tablet.